I can't hear you if you speak. So, so sorry. So, uh, I will start soon. So, uh, hello to, uh, to, the, to the class, <coughs> Phenomenological Intersections in Aesthetics by Adam Berg. In this seminar, which is structured topically as a series of probing into some fundamental concepts, methods, and tasks of phenomenological research in relation to aesthetics and art, we will hone on how Husserlian and post Husserlian phenomenological intersect with contemporary aesthetic discourse. Aesthetics stands here for both a radical conception of an underlying principle organizing perception as well as a no normative or deviant applied or embodied aesthetics of art. Our main readings and analysis will be from Husserl's various texts we will, we will examine also writing by Brentano, Heidegger, Stein, Fink, Merleau, Ponty, Levinas, Deleuze, and Lyotard, as well as Varela and Petitot. Key topics will focus on intersubjectivity and the life world, genetic and static constitutions, empathy and the body, first person perspective and perception of and the question of naturalizing phenomenology. Adam Berg is a philosophy and artist, PhD in philosophy from the University of Haifa, art and architecture in Academia delle Belle Arti Rome and University of Toronto, teaches philosophy and critical theory at Otis College of Art and Design, liberal arts and at Cal Arts Critical Studies. Recent publications are Phenomenological, Phenomenology and the Question of Time, Lexington Books, 2017. If Hostess, if Hostess re re Reloaded, composed for 10 hands, If Hester Reloaded, Confessioni per Ten Mani. I will now give the class to Anna. I can't hear you. Patrick? Yes? Are you waiting for me? Yes. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Adam. And um, I thought that maybe we should get started by introducing ourselves, even though I know we're not like in full form right now. But I think it would be conducive to kind of establishing a free flow a conversational style. Even though it's, it's a lecture based, uh, I'm hoping that it will be more like a kind of a dialogical uh, format rather than a, a kind of my just presentations. And so um, before I get started on the preliminaries of the class and my introductory lecture, I thought maybe we can uh, do like a, a quick uh, swing and, and present ourselves. So I'm Adam, and I just got presented by Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, anyone else would like to introduce herself, oneself? Yeah. Let me ask you, Adam, do we have another Adam? I'll go by the order that I see on the screen. Okay, yeah, uh, I'm also Adam. I'm a graduate student at the New School uh, in philosophy, and I study a lot of um, structural Marxism. I'm interested in, like, structuralism, but then also phenomenology. So I study a lot of Husserl as well. Um, yeah. And uh, Jay, I think it may be Jason or... No, Jay. Oh yeah, here you are. Is it working? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah it's working. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm James and uh, my 
researches around the theological intersections, um, theological and aesthetic intersections, mostly, especially in terms of uh, brain structures that are activated during these moments. Um, a lot of uh, psychedelics and Buddhism is what you're going to hear from me, probably. Hmm. So I'm actually pretty new to uh, to phenomenology. I've read almost none of this, so this is kind of interesting to um, see a different take on the same things that I've sort of been looking at, like an entirely different culture is is uh, how it appears. And it's kind of cool to um, to get some introductory uh, stuff. Merlo Ponty, especially, has been interesting so far. Okay, thank you. And uh, next we have. Is that Laura? Hi, um, I'm Laura. Um, my background is in fine arts, and but I currently work as a software engineer. So my background in philosophy is rather limited to courses that were in an art school context rather than right. research-based. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Patrick, did you want to introduce yourself? You mean me? Yeah. Oh, I, I come from also from the fields of arts. I studied in the Academy of Fine Arts, Vienna, with Harun Faraki. And I'm basically most of the time a filmmaker. And we read a lot of phenomenology, but uh, I'm very interested in your perspectives. Mm -hmm. Great. And text, June. Uh, Tejin. He is currently writing that his microphone is off and is not possible to use it right now. So I think we have William. William Hi. Long. I'm William. Uh, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley in rhetoric. Um, I work on a combination of theory, um, Primarily, people like Phyllis and Bataille and their intersection with things like AI and epigenetics, but especially through a lens of thinking phenomenologically and speculative uh, and writing in sort of a speculative manner. So, approaching those things through a philosophical way is kind of what mm -hmm. I'm interested in. This is my first uh, seminar with the new center because I joined yesterday. Uh, that's great. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> I think I'll I'll get started if that's okay. And um, I should say that first of all, I wanted to expound a little bit on the notion of the the aesthetics and why, in a sense, we're approaching aesthetics in a post Kantian in a post Kantian sense on two different levels that are often kept. Uh, in in a sort of ad hoc dichotomy. Uh, on the one hand, we have what we can um, call a radical aesthetics, which is often asso associated with what I will expound later as Kant's um, transcendental aesthetics and also Husserl, and uh, that basically deals with the foundational kind of analysis of perception, how perception is enacted structured uh, specifically through the uh, concepts of the a priori and uh, intuition in Kant. So that's one, one way to look at aesthetics, which is in effect very little to do with artworks for, as such. I mean, it's a, it's a more kind of, the, the word aesthetics in some, to some extent it's misleading because we're assuming today through the vernacular that what we mean by aesthetic objects or aesthetic discourse uh, stands for uh, specifically for like art and cultural uh, cultural production but uh, as as it kind of evolved philosophically it actually stems from a much more um uh, you know philosophical grounded uh, discourse on the notion of uh, perception and specifically the tradition that followed uh, empiricism 
specifically British empiricism, and now is more or less kind of wrapped around the concept of phenomenal or phenomenalism. So that's the one type of uh, uh, kind of uh, take on, uh, on aesthetics. The other one has to do with more commonsensical use of the word aesthetics that comes again to discourse and discursive analysis of aesthetic objects such as artworks, uh, pop culture, uh, mass media, uh, politics, and so on. And we can, uh, we can uh, relate to this type of form of aesthetic experience as the constitution of objects, of social objects, uh, that have to some extent to do with uh, individual uh, interlocking perceptions of the object. And uh, specifically in phenomenology, it comes through the notion of intersubjectivity as, again, I will kind of deal later. Uh, the scope of this class uh, is specifically, uh, you know, structured on two takes that are kind of post-Kantian in their perspective. On the one hand, we have Husserl uh, that attempted to kind of uh, follow Kant, but also radicalize Kant. And Husserl's take on uh, aesthetics, specifically his transcendental aesthetics, is very different from the Kantian take. And uh, what we can call uh, as, a, as a kind of a, as an inversion of the Kantian understanding of objects in relation to subjects. Uh, the other perspective is uh, Gilles Deleuze, but it's not limited just to Deleuze, but Deleuze's understanding of subjects as a, again, as an inversion of subjects, as some of you may have known uh, from his conception of machinic uh, subjects or desiring machines or a kind of a mechanization of the subject. So uh, in terms of uh, the Kantian take, and I'm using very broad brush strokes uh, to paint the scenario right now, the kind of creating a mise-en-scene for our conversation later on, uh, that will also include some referencing to the reading that I posted as a preliminary readings. So in terms of the Kantian take, I would say that the Kantian take on aesthetics has to do with the notion of primarily uh, the a priori, and the a priori is based on um, on the schematization of space-time intuitions. So what is the Kantian revolution in that sense, the kind of the essence of it? It has to do with the fact that for Kant, the notion of aesthetic object uh, of aesthetic experience has to do with subjectivity. The subject interlocking onto reality assumes the what we later can understand as the objective stratum of the world. So Kant, so-called uh, transcendental idealism or uh, transcendental objectivity or objective idealism is in fact a kind of a way that reiterates the objectivity of the world within the subject's experience of the world. And how so? Uh, if you think about mathematics, what is a number, what is an a priori knowledge that is obviously a, a kind of part of a deductive way of reasoning, it's based on analyticity. And that type of analyticity is not induced from experience per se, but it's assuming experience, the possibility of experience itself. So in other words, the analyticity and thus the a priori forms of or ways of knowing what we call a priori knowledge, such as uh, arithmetic, uh, geometry, and so on, without getting into the complexities and irregularities of what kind of mathematics and geometry Kant had in mind for the moment. But all these sort of mathematical manifolds or objects assume a plane of subjectivity in the Kantian sense. That is, they are first and foremost comprehensible to us as form of intuitions. And what kind of intuitions? 
The substratum of intuition is the schematization of space-time intuitions. For example, as many have noted, uh, you know, human perception is not just about the content of perception, it's about the structuring of perception. If you look at uh, the monitor right now that we're like uh, talking to the, the screen, uh, our uh, perception of uh, stills, of still images per second, like in animation sense, is much slower than a German shepherd or a, a wolf in the sense of a predatory animal that has a more accelerated kind of perception of uh, frames per second. This type of schematization, the fact that what uh, Gombrich uh, mentioned in the Kantian sense that we cannot see around corners or that we don't have an, a, a kind of an innate infrared perception or that we don't have like uh, a radar uh, or a magnetic field perceptory uh, uh, abilities defines us as, as an organism uh, within its innate schematization. So the Kantian revolution came as a response to the human uh, profound doubt about the, the so-called problem of induction. And the problem of induction is the fact that most of our phenomenal knowledge in the empiricist tradition is induced from experience. So we have a kind of a vicious circle that experience both establishes the folklore of perception and yet it has to be reiterated or tested by perception itself. And the perceptual experience becomes then entangled with its own supposition or presuppositions in the human uh, uh, problem of induction that how can we know for sure that all ravens are black if we are locked into this this type of perceptual uh, problem of having to observe or to reiterate that all ravens are black and what if we have an irregular albino raven then it sort of uh, poses a kind of an inconsistency with the assumption of induction so kant's revolutionary step is in fact to establish that there is a transcendental step uh, in the assumption of the objectivity of the world. If we go into the analyticity of knowledge, we have to assume a priori as structured on the way that we schematize temporal and, and spatial or orders. Uh, so, for, so, do you have any questions or remarks so far before I go into Husserl and Deleuze? It seems that the class has no 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 questions. So, so let me talk a little bit now about Husserl, and I'm going to kind of abbreviate uh, the Husserlian position on aesthetics, uh, uh, so that I can then kind of reopen some of the questions in terms of how we are to look at both Husserl's and the Les positions in relation to Kant and how how they lead us to what I would say is the topos or the kind of the, the area that uh, this seminar is focusing on. Husserl's position, in fact, inverts the transcendental relation between objective knowledge and subjectivity. If, as I pointed out, the substratum of objectivity is in the Kantian sense is to is to be found in the way that the a priori is structured within the schematization of space and time intuitions. For Husserl, uh, the notion of a transcendental aesthetics has to do with the fact that the subject is in a sense found in an intentional stance. An intentional stance here is the relation of what he calls the noemata noema. Uh, in other words, how we look at uh, 
aesthetics experience has to do with the fact that first and foremost, aesthetic experience is founded on intentionality. And that it takes from Brentano. In a sense, what uh, Husserl does to, to Kant, he actually inverts the order of the subject-object nexus into a, re a relation that establishes first the objects within consciousness. Deleuze does a similar thing in relation to uh, schema not schematization of uh, objects, but actually subjects, when he talk about assemblages and when he talks about uh, desiring machines, it goes into what is to be uh, essentially Husserlian distinction between transcendent and transcendental planes. In the Kantian realm, and that, that is in relation to what I'm going to say about uh, Deleuze. In the Kantian realm, the, dis the fundamental distinction is between transcendent and immanent objects. For example, if I uh, take my cup of uh, tea right now, and I sip from the cup of tea, you have no idea, apart from my linguistic uh, positation, that it is tea and not vodka inside, for that matter. In other words, the notion of the content of the liquid that I sipped from is transcendent to what appeared to be the case, the imminent exposition itself, right? So in a way, uh, Immanence and transcendence are two complementary modalities in the Kantian understanding of aesthetic constitutions. Whereas the transcendental plane actually is never subjected to an object of perception or a subject or a subjectivity as a singular occasion or event. That creates a kind of a paradox for Deleuze. The Deleuzean paradox is that what we can call the kind of the self or the what he would call like later with uh, Guattari, the illusion of interiority is basically an assumption about the objective conditions of the subject's perception. So he does a kind of the opposite thing that Husserl does to aesthetics trans in, in his transcendental aesthetics. In other words, he underlines and highlights the, obje the objective, if you want, machine conditions under which we assume subjectivity. For example, if I go, if I listen to music, and all of you know the experience of musical experience, if I listen to a musical composition or to a song, and I'm interrupted, say I have a phone call, or I have to go and uh, open the door, when I go back to the temporal objects that we can refer to as music, I actually take it from the point that I left it, right? I'm sort of left with the same coordinates that in the Deleuzean sense produce what we can call a plane of subjectivity or what Deleuze calls like a plane of pure immanence. What is this sort of plane of pure immanence? It's precisely how subjectivity is produced. So the lens goes in the opposite way to Husserl, insofar as Husserl uh, affirms the enigma of subjectivity. That is the the kind of the the fact that every object is first and foremost either a directional or orientational or conscious intentional object. Any type of music, for Husserl, for that matter, is an intentional object. For Deleuze, any type of music is actually an, an objective conditions, or the objective conditions that generate subjectivity. So what I would like to propose is a sort of a kind of a two perspectives that are seen that seem to be transcendent of both the conditions under which both Husserl and later Deleuze 
wrote and thought their kind of uh, philosophies. The first is related to uh, what we can call, uh, generally speaking, AI or intelligent systems. So that unlike Deleuze's assumption, uh, we have conditions under which uh, the machine, analogy to the to the kind of the to the subject, are expanded into intersubjective machines, which we can call like networks or systems. And in Husserlian sense, the one of his conceptions of the life world or intersubjectivity can be expanded to an to the notion of interobjectivity. So that what is often or occasionally referred to as post phenomenology or as a naturalized phenomenology can be understood also and and I would say more than also but primarily as new conditions which challenge both Husserl and Deleuze. How so? Well, they challenge Husserl precisely because the notion of intentionality and also the notion of autonomy of art objects, in specifically in terms of art and cultural productions, are challenged. And not just in terms of the internet, for example, or like forms of uh, augmented perception, but also in terms of the matrix itself and the manifolds themselves of perception. Uh, one of the key aspects of any phenomenological analysis, and I will go into it later today, is, in, is in, indeed related to the notion of origin, what is called uh, in the Greek arche, uh, as, as, in, as, as it stands in archaeology and so on. I mean, it's in German the Ursprung, uh, in, in both uh, Husserl's and later Heidegger's articulation. And the notion of origin, or what we can call in English genesis of, uh, of objects, has to do with the assumption that somehow the world is given to us, or is evidence to us, rather, in, in two forms. One as evidence, and that type of evidence is essential to uh, any kind of rational a component that I will quote in a, in a few minutes from Husserl and his understanding or stressing of the notion of crisis. And the other, the other aspects is in fact related to a kind of a much more radical understanding for Deleuze, which has to do with a kind of a proliferation, a horizontal proliferation, what he refers to as plateaus that lack any kind of vertical constitution of subject object and that later plays in his articulation with Guattari of the notion of the rhizome and, uh, and other kind of metaphorical or tropes that he's using in order to actually establish the grounds for talking about basically what we can understand as aesthetic constitutions. What we are looking at now, and in that sense, we can look at it vis-a-vis -vis either speculative realism or accelerationism, uh, is a kind of modes of cognition that are not originated from the vertical constitution of objects and subjects, nor are they to be found in a kind of a plane of or horizon in the phenomenological sense of intersubjectivity. But since they are constituted interobjectively, independently of subjective uh, realization, their experience, and I here use the word experience in the utmost kind of uh, teleological sense of experience is fundamentally connected to the notion of the universal abstraction of philosophy. Uh, to read uh, a quote from Husserl, I would say that 
what he refers in his book on the crisis of phenomenology of European, uh, the crisis of European, uh, European uh, science and phenomenology. He says the crisis could become clear as a seeming collapse of rationalism. Still, as we said, the reason for the downfall of a rational culture does not lie in the essence of rationalism itself, but only in its exteriorization, its absorption in naturalism or objectivism. So here I wanted to expound on that a little bit further. What does uh, Husserl mean when he refers to the notion of naturalism and objectivism? So first of all, in a phenomenological take, Husserl makes a distinction between the natural attitude and naturalistic aptitudes. Naturalism, and this is naturalism and objectivism are the two facets of the same phenomenon, which is basically the vulgar scientific worldview, results in a sort of in a unconscious metaphysical assumptions about the real. As opposed to naturalism, the natural attitude is still grounded in a naive kind of realm of perception that needs to be attained or arrived at through the phenomenological method of reduction. So I'm not even going there yet how it is to be achieved. Similarly, Deleuze's notion of pure immanence and his access of both Hume and Bergson assumes a phenomenal stratum of a given of evidence that is twofold. And I think that we can argue uh, safely that this twofoldedness of, of the evidence is found both in Husserl and Deleuze. And there are two forms of uh, kind of uh, a givenness or evidence. The first one is the notion of the given, or what, what is called often in analytic philosophy in the Quanian sense, the myth of the given, the perkipi, right? The sort of the, percep the, percep the perceivable given. And the other one is the pre-given. Uh, in the less as in Husserl, the notion of the pre-given establishes a different kind of horizon. The horizon of the pre-given is mostly relegated to what we what Husserl designates also as the genetic horizon or to constitutions that are passive syntheses and they're related to what we can call historicity. So let me illustrate that through an object. The, the aesthetic object that we are used to is an artwork. You know, artworks are perfect examples of both a kind of the display of historicity and the specific uh, transcendental capacity of, of their content or form or both to go beyond the point of reference. If you think about Caravaggio, Caravaggio now stands for us as an implosive possibility and I hope that you all know uh, who I'm talking about when I say Caravaggio, the painter, the Italian painter, both in terms of uh, sexuality and in terms of its relation to uh, the photographic image. Even though both in terms of sexual politics or the his specific historicity of Caravaggio, photography was not there yet, and definitely uh, uh, identity politics and sexuality as such was not ideated in the Foucaultian sense yet. And yet there is a transcendental aspect in Caravaggio that allows us to refract atemporally, to some extent anachronistically, uh, the aesthetic object even without its utter grounding in its uh, sense of historicity. 
So that sense of crisis is eminent for Husserl, because what Husserl is saying to us is something that is kind of, again, Delusian in a different way, and that is that us in techno-modern culture, and he takes the designation of a European culture as a kind of as elapsed paradigm of philosophical speculation or reflection, have collapsed into a version of thought, of universals, of essences that are prescriptive to a specific vulgar metaphysics of science. In other words, even though in its origin science is extrapolated from this sort of radical motion towards the universal and in turn always in contrast to the historical narrative or specificity which we can call historicity in the Hegelian sense of course so that we can distinguish between historical facts and historicity as historicity already inherently proposing a kind of a narrative, a kind of an episteme in Foucault's sense or a zeitgeist in Hegel's sense. So there is a sort of a sense of collapse that the narrative is taking over what later Merleau-Ponty also and Sartre would identify as the fac historical facticity. In fact, this is the real scene of the crime for most of what Michel Foucault did. The sort of the tension between transcendent and transcendental concepts that are bound in this sort of vacillation between historicity and facticity, or what he calls positivities, if you're familiar with Foucault. So, where are we now in terms of this sort of collision of two kind of plateaus? On the one hand, the ability to ground aesthetic objects has receded from us. And that has to do with what Deleuze identified as multiplicities. And multiplicity is not just as part of a selection menu and a commodity different kind of a commodity driven and neoliberal capitalism and so on, the kind of the postmodern predicament of a diversification of exchange value and commodity, but actually multiplicity as multiple vantage points onto which we can ground perception as a universal condition. And one of the books that we'll look into, one of the two books, in fact, is uh, Deleuze's analysis of Francis Bacon in The Logic of Sense, or The Logic of Sensation, actually. Uh, and he makes kind of interesting distinction based on both the paradox of perception as imminent and as transcendent at the same time. The other aspect which I promise to kind of address is the notion of crisis as going beyond the methods and tasks of phenomenology. And so that before I go on and I basically review uh, other kind of aspects of that, I wanted to stop here and see if there are any comments, questions, thoughts, things to open up because, you know, if to, to use a Delusian kind of trope, it's always better to start from the middle. I, I hate the first lecture also in, in real space because I, I actually don't know where to kind of situate myself in relation to, to you, but I would stop here and ask you to kind of either comments, comment, reflect, interact, so I know where we, we can sort of move beyond this uh, point of uh, the, my presentation. Adam, can I yeah. start with, by a uh, couple of questions? I mean, actually, it's one question. My question is, 
And it's just like, um, in my study of phenomenology, uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, interested to relate Bergson's temporality to Husserl's phenomenology and sort of like, and especially given, given the readings of Bergson that Deleuze had done both in his Bergsonism, but also in the cinema book. But also, I was also interested in the way this sort of like less known philosopher and sort of like phenomenologist named Alfred Schutz related oh, yeah. Husserl, to, uh, Husserl to Bergson. So I was wondering if you have any kind of like comment about like, do you find anything valuable in Bergson's contribution here? And mm -hmm. also, do you find anything valuable in Alfred Schutz's contribution? Because, the, because, because for what I was doing in phenomenology, I found Schultz very, very productive. Yes. Also, I have that book as PDF and I can share it to the class, The Phenomenology of Social World, in which yeah. he basically base, base, bases a lot of it on, on late, 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 late Husserl and Husserl's idea of like what he called yeah. like, uh, intersubjective temporality or temporal intersubjectivity or something like that, yeah. right? So yeah, so just like if you can if you can comment yeah, absolutely. On, I mean, on Bergson and on Schultz and their relevance to class and your interest, or maybe they're not related and I would never bring them up. No, no, uh, they're, they're actually in, intricately related. And I, I appreciate you bringing them up. Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, Bergson, well, let me, let me actually start with Schultz because Schultz and you know, the addition of Schutz uh, and Lachmann, the construction of the life world, is an excellent introduction. What Schutz did, and he was a professor at the new uh, school. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but he's kind of an unknown figure, and new school doesn't celebrate him so much. Yeah, but even though he basically almost single-handedly passed the baton of Husserl to sociology and the humanities in the U.S. Uh, and, and that's an excellent point, because... Schutz, in a sense, is a perfect bridge also to Heidegger, not just to Husserl, because his conception of the Lebenswelt, uh, the kind of the life world, is a really interested kind of take on the notion of multiple realities, what he called multiple realities. So uh, you're absolutely correct, and, and it would be extremely uh, valuable to analyze Schutz in continuity with Husserl, especially the notion of intersubjectivity. And uh, for example, just to kind of uh, explicate one aspect of what you are suggesting, um, the notion of shock, of Stoss, that is also central, very central to, Hus uh, to Heidegger, is explained by Schutz also on a semiotic level as the shift between one realm to another. For example, if I watch also on the semiotic level the constitution of the body in sports, in the boxing arena, and then in the military, and then in pop culture, uh, we experienced a kind of a radical shift or a shock experience that we, uh, we suppress. Obviously, we suppress. We kind of relegate it to a kind of a normative, habitual, commonsensical shift in in a kind of in a, in a gameness in a kind of the rules of the game but we overlook the over the overall universal transcendental or transcendent rather uh, locus of of the body as such as an example and uh, so Schutz is really important in developing a kind of a few facets of Husserlian phenomenology especially the genetic kind uh, into the realm of both sociology, anthropology, but also uh, what you can call aesthetic constitutions of of, uh, of objects. So that that is one one way. But just to touch on what you said, but let me go first to Bergson. I think that Bergson definitely is situated in a monolithic parallel relation to Husserl. I think some of the uh, Bergsonian insights into phenomenology are radically different from Husserl, 
and some are absolutely identical, uh, depending on how you look at them. I would like to uh, take on two issues that are both similar and different in response to your question or to your thoughts. The first one, is related to what is called uh, the temporal analysis of time or the analysis of, of analysis of time in Bergson in relation to his concept of duration of durée and his understanding of durée as uniquely irreducible to metri metric analysis or to what he perceived as a kind of as a scientific breakdown of temporality his refusal is very much grounded in a conception of vitalism. Alain Vital is, is a kind of a grounding factor for Bergson. So Bergson, unlike Husserl, doesn't accept the differentiation between objective time and temporal constitution as part of the core constitution of consciousness. So, so that's one difference, one different. A difference between Husserl and Bergson, but there is a, also a, a great similarity b between Bergson and Deleuze, and of course Deleuze, in a kind of in a in a similar mo move to to Proust, wanted to create a kind of a Bergsonian philosophy or a novel, a, a sort of a kind of a a work that will put Bergson in motion. And in a sense, what I think there is a difference between what uh, Deleuze calls Bergsonism and to the real kind of presence of Bergson in Deleuze philosophy, right? Uh, in as much as he makes a distinction between the cinematic component in the, in Bergson, so and Bergson's own own influence. So that, that is another kind of aspect that I find intriguing in comparing Bergson to Husserl, because when you actually read Bergson's take on cinema, and he was the generation that first got exposed to the invention of the cinema and so on, he's actually quite hostile to cinema. Even though uh, Deleuze makes adjustments to kind of look at Bergson as a cinematic philosopher, as a philosophy of montage, as a philosophy of the ability to kind of look at what Bergson looked uh, called the flux of mental images, as consciousness is the flux of mental images, which is very much the language of cinema in, in, in the kind of rudimentary sense. I think the first point is vitalism, the second that he, and I think vitalism is not shared by Husserl for different reasons, but I think what they both share is a fundamental critique of what I would call vulgar scientificism or materialism or objectivism in the vulgar occult sense. That is that science and only science can give us the true picture of what we see of what we experience, of what we deal with. And I think they they attempted to kind of approach it in different ways, but I think they share this sort of profound identification of the collapse or what Husserl identifies the crisis of European sciences as the concretization of the universal abstraction of knowledge as praxis, not only as theoria. So once you get this sort of collapse, literally collapse of uh, thinking a rigorous science becoming prescriptive technique of science, you find that historicity, historicity implodes into the subject matter of thinking and art objects are no no longer constitute experiences, but rather illustrations of these sort of epochal moments in history. And that is definitely identified by Bergson as well. So, I mean, this is just like, I think you're bringing up like a, a huge topic, or at least in relation to Bergson, 
if to pick it there back on to what you said about Alfred Schutz, I would also add that the importance of Schutz was also in understanding the phenomenological turn, and that actually relates to why I gave you to read from Zahavi's Rutledge kind of introduction to phenomenology, is that really phenomenology is not so much like a kind of a delineated body of knowledge, rather than a kind of a tentative or a set of tentatives of tasks and methods in motion, uh, which is perhaps identifiable by three different kind of components or dimensions of philosophical thinking from the onset. The first one is the notion of what we can call what Husserl makes a distinction later on between transcendental and formal logic. So we can call it in our kind of terminology, the logic of the possible, or in, uh, in, the, Bergson in the Bergsonian and also the Deleuzian sense, the notion of the actual and the virtual or the potential. So the field, the field of potentialities, which also translates into multiplicities. And that's the kind of specific understanding also of the layers of the virtual, not as non-real, but as part of constituting part of the plane of the real. So the first is what we can call the logic of the possible. The second is the Greek notion that Husserl revisits and readapt from Descartes, and that's the epoche. And the epoche is a kind of a doubt that is not taken literally as doubting of something. For example, I'm not doubting that I'm talking to you right now, because that would be futile. That would actually constitute what Deleuze calls a kind of a paranoia, not a real doubt. So this sort of stratum of the pre-given is evidence to us. We all know that we're talking to each other, but I can doubt something as a method, not as a content, as a method. So the epoche would be the second type of doubt that got diluted in the evolution of philosophical thinking because it got more and more entrenched with techniques and techniques are more occupying themselves with defending their positions rather than taking a radical view of themselves and putting themselves into question again and again and again. And the third one I would call it is the speculative instinct or the speculative impulse of philosophy. And the speculative impulse of philosophy is actually can be understood in the Greek sense of the word speculum, which means mirroring. So there are one, one way is to say it is that philosophy is a reflecting by representing, by mirroring uh, situations, state of affairs. But the second type of speculum or speculare is the sense of reflecting through rational constructions. And I think that's what Husserl is, is referring to in his kind of analysis of the crisis of European philosophy, which I think this is in a kind of in a more literal sense what we're witnessing right now, the collapse of the after collapse, if you want, of European sciences. In other words, we're, we're at, at, at the bay where we have the kind of the, the, the oceans streaming into the lake that we call the kind of the Mediterranean basin, right? That is creating a kind of a geological event that we are identifying on the one hand as this sort of implosion of multiplicities, a disappearance of a universal sense of the transcendental, and yet a deacceleration of the crisis through an impasse of techniques. So I think that's where I would identify both Schutz and, uh, and Bergson, absolutely. I mean, because they both intuit the same things that later Deleuze and contemporaneously Husserl uh, intuited as well. So 
Look, I, I hope I'm not taking too much time. So, so based on what you said, is it, is it like my assumption is like phenomena, like especially who so places phenomenology somewhere between sort of like uh, metaphysics and science as sort of this middle ground. Things like classic metaphysics fail to fail to explain the world, and science has not yet been able to have a proper account of the world. Until then, for now, we're just going to like propose this method, which is phenomenology, through which we limit, we put limits on on this in, on, on 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 this speculum. And basically, knowing how humans co-produce the world with, so like how, how they how they co-produce the world through experiencing it, we're going to give an interim account until we find better ways of explaining the world through science. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, I, mean, I, I would I would say, I, would say I, would say much. Much. I get an echo. No, now I'm okay. But I, uh, I would say this much, uh, I, I totally agree. I think that Husserl and Bergson both identifies, uh, identify metaphysics as a continuum, with, as continuous with the scientific worldview. In fact, one can argue that Bergson's critique of Kant, for example, is not really a critique lit technically of Kant. It's a critique of the scientific vulgarization of Kantianism, on which uh, the notion that a first philosophy, that is a, a triadic philosophy that I sketched before in a very rudimentary sense, uh, that is based on uh, the, log the what we can call the logic of the of the possible the doubt, the methodological doubt of the epoche and the, specul the speculative impulse are diffused. So in a sense, um, if indeed metaphysics become self-absorbed with assuming its worldview, then it's not only polluted, it's polluting. It's actually a very dangerous in the, even in the Adorno's sense of negative dialectics. I mean, in that sense, metaphysics is an over medicated kind of remedy to the wrong pathology. But at the same time, scientificism in Husserl's and Bergson's sense, and I think in Deleuze in a more kind of playful sense, is not to be confused with science. Science is not simply about techniques. Science is also about, primarily about hypo hypotheses, hypothetical thinking, experiments, uh, doing things with thoughts, with formulations. So the notion of a first philosophy is absolutely lost. Uh, when we split the transcendental, that is the universal abstraction, or the need for universal uh, for universal abstractions between metaphysics and scientific worldview. But at the same time, I would have to caution that first philosophy in the in the Cartesian sense is no longer viable. A first philosophy would also have to address its opposite motion that is not as a motion backwards in the Heideggerian sense, kind of prima philosophia, but onwards as there are new agencies and intersections with new types of systems and, and kind of learning capacities. So in other words, I think that in the Bergsonian and Husserlian sense, it is true that the metaphysical claim can be self-deflating because it's, it can very much 
fall into the trap of prescriptiveness, of prescri prescribing metaphysical remedies only to self-assure its own kind of position. Or the scientific worldview can go against, I would say, an or non-dogmatic evolution of scientific theories or experiments. So that that is uh, thank that you is so much. Yeah. Maybe maybe, um, others, maybe can others maybe others can join the conversation. I think I think Adam was going to say something. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get some more clarification on how you've sort of laid out the Husserl Deleuze relationship. So on the one hand, you were saying that, so in Husserl, every object is um, the intentional correlate of an act of the subject. So all the objects are sort of within a unifying or central subject in some sense. Whereas in Deleuze, we have different objective conditions for subjectivation, so different assemblages, and we, we kind of pass through uh, different sorts of individuation within these objective networks um and then you said that there's a new paradigm which is interobjective could you uh ex explain that a bit more yes so first of all let me just quickly rehearse what what you mentioned the first is that indeed Husserl notion of the noemata or the intentional object means that objectivity is not in the in the Gegenstand sense of like an evidenced object is the same as object. In fact, I would, I would suggest in a commonsensical sense that when we use object as a verb, even in English, we mean it to object to a position, right? So what, what does it mean to, I have an objection towards something? It means that I actually use a content of my conscious reflection as a way to mitigate someone else's subjectivity. So when I object to someone's opinion, for example, if we think politics for, uh, as, uh, for a moment, if I object to say Trump uh, policies of uh, deportation, I'm, I'm, what is to object to Trump's you know, policies of deportation? It is precisely in the Husserlian sense to place a conscious of object of my reflection into the thresholds of other subjects, right? Do you see? Do you see what I'm saying here? So, unlike um, unlike Kant, Husserl is proposing not a subjectivistic notion of the object, but rather that the object is the boundary lines between or a threshold between the ability to object, if you want, and in another articulation would be to form a type of empathy with other subjects. That's why the example of both Merleau-Ponty and Husserl is always about the constitution of object in relation to the body. I'm holding my, I'm pressing on my wrist, and my wrist is pressed by my finger, and what do I feel? Do I feel the pressure on my wrist? Husserl and Berlopoti asks, ask, or do I feel the the pressuring finger? Right? I mean, already there there is a notion of a threshold. Now, in terms of uh, what I uh, suggested, in terms of interobjectivity, I'm uh, you are absolutely correct. I'm 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 uh, suggesting that. If we, even though the Husserlian and the Lusian notion of constitution of subjectivity and objectivity is inexhaustible, there is a new modality of objectivity that is generated these days or in our time from what you can call an autopoetic genesis of machines or 
intelligent machines or agents give birthing new type of processes which I would I will I would refrain from calling them technically computational processes because that will be a kind of a metaphorical stretch I would say that we're at the point now that our inter uh, interaction with with the world is no longer relegated to a subject object mitigations or even the mitigations of object subjects through the domain of the Schutzian intersubjectivity. Okay? We are, we have entered a world that goes beyond Buber's distinction of the two categories of, be, of being as objects and subjects or Dasein in the Heideggerian sense. And it's no longer just a discourse on the embeddedness of subjects within the objectivity of the world. It actually implies a different ontological category of being, and that is that the being itself, let me just uh, turn off the phone. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, so in other words, wh what is this sort of interobjectivity is something that I will be exploring through precisely what I, I take to be paradigmatically exemplified more through art today than through science or te technological si uh, oriented science. And why? Because there is a growing infusion not of what Deleuze called a kind of illusion of interiority, but I would call like objective constructions of subjectivity as types of exteriority. Take, for example, uh, communication on social media. Communication in social media is not a new kind of intersubjectivity in the sense that Mo was implying in reference to shoots. It's actually a new type of exteriority that mimics the illusion of interiority in the Deleuzian sense. But the specular kind of speculative aspect of mirroring is not exclusive to humans. In fact, we have a lot of uh, ability now to be part of this embeddedness of learning agents that are non-human by definition that are doing it better facial recognition uh, profiling different type of algorithmic breakdowns of data that what Husser calls in experience and judgment a probabilistic human distribution of identities mind you Hume the great empiricist calls, calls uh, a self the flux of ideas or the flux of sensations. Uh, Non-human agencies now are able to stabilize these fluxes of probabilistic, probabilistic distribution of sensations better than a subject, a subjective agent. So in that sense, interobjectivity is the possibility or the, the, the kind of the thought that we have entered a new ontology or a new ontology, ontological ground at which we can no longer relate solely on the Husserlian or the Lusian inversion of Kantian epistemology of, of self and world. That's the point. So, so the yeah. reason that this is not Deleuzian is because these sort of artificial intelligences, they're kind of autopoetic systems. Is, is that where it, whereas in Deleuze we have sort of 
I guess I'm, I'm struggling to see. Yeah, well, Deleuze already kind of uh, takes into consideration autopoetic uh, possibilities, emergent possibilities between desiring machines, assemblages themselves. That is actually not an exclusive point in Deleuze's articulation. What is, however, new is the notion of exteriorization of sub subjects. And subjects no longer as purely defined as human vital agencies, but as forms of new mediation. So that is definitely not Deleuzean, because Deleuze doesn't take the possibility, simply because of you know discrepancies of historical anachronism. It, it, he and Foucault wrote and thought before the invention of the internet just as, as a case as a case example but it's beyond the internet it's as i said even if you look at social media social media is not an expansion of subjective space or intersubjective space social media is also the creation of new exteriority that uses subjective interiors as moments within as a building blocks of kind of establishing this type of construction. So it's a very much not a space of potentiality or virtual capacity or vectorial movement. It's already a kind of a new ground, a new ontological ground. So in that sense, I don't think that uh, we can argue that either with even an expanded field of Husserl's shoots intersubjectivity we can include new provinces of meaning or new kind of realities because social media as a case or AI in general is more than just a multi one more variant in the multiplicity of realities. It's actually a restructuring, a rewiring of how realities also are intertwined. And in the Delusian sense, I don't think that we can look at AI uh, or any type of like computational agents or even social media and the internet, uh, specifically a kind of a semi-spherical uh, realm as a, as, as a form of, uh, you know, another kind of layer of multiplicity or a rhizomatic kind of proliferation of sorts. So I don't know if I'm kind of addressing what you're asking but well maybe 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 i'll try to like add something if you don't mind adam or yeah, maybe absolutely. i don't mind adam because i'm 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 asking permission from two different adams yeah uh, like uh, it was i remember in december 2000 december 2017 right after a month and a half after the election of trump i was uh doing a book launch at eflux this new center published book called uh uh, it's called for machine use only, and it's got a it's got a it's got a longer title, but it, but the book is called uh, mach, uh, for machine use only. And I remember the topic of the day was like the election of Trump and the role that and the role that social media played in, in the election. And of course, the the normative leftist narrative was fake news, right? But I I brought up something similar to what Adam's bringing up today, and it's really like. I'm really glad that he's addressing it uh, under the heading of onto objectivity. I said, what what was happening on the social media? Uh, I mean, sure, you can talk about it in terms of fake news and like the proliferation of like like lies. But actually, what I, I said there was a type, there was a different type of intersubjectivity that that was actually like how Adam was describing it, an intersubjectivity that wasn't like. If, if in Schultzian and Husserlian sense, intersubjectivity is about like a collective, ex collective semi-passive experiencing of the world, this new type of intersubjectivity is like a collective re reproducing or like how you say exterior exteriorization of a world. And that's why right was much more successful in doing it on the left, because right was actually out there using like all sorts of like machine agents, like bots on Twitter, fake users on Facebook, whatever, to sort of like actively create this 
fake version of intersubjectivity or a, or simulate a kind of intersubjectivity by by collective participation and creation of this these 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 things which which left wants to call fake news you yeah. always have had fake news yeah, right yeah. So what was new here was what was new here was this new method of like method of collective participation on the part of the right right and the yeah. alt right or whatever you want to call it to actively to actually do what you just described as like this ex exter the production of exteriority. Yeah, yeah, I would add to it a kind of a, a distinction that uh, prevails also in uh, in Merleau-Ponty and South in relation to the political and the historical, and that is the notion of historicity in relation to facticity. So if I would re-articulate what you just said, Mo, I would say that the right was far more successful in creating exterior facades to facticity and not creating hypothetical or conjectural relations to facts. So they, they became like almost like an entropic event that the more the left was entrenched and involved in fact checking, the left, the right was able to cantilever this massive monolith of facticity and it was really as as you describe it translating the fact checks into a failure to embrace facticity and it's of course it's what um what hegel and later south would call it's a false consciousness because this facticity has nothing to do with either reality or the world or any kind of mitigation of objects and subjects, but it's fueled by the ability to withdraw from any sense of subjectivity onto a new type of exteriority that uses subjectivity as a mask. So, and that also in a psychoanalytical existential sense, again, if I go on to South and Simone de Beauvoir, I would argue that in that sense, self-denial is worse than lying. So the, the left is, is caught up in this sort of spiral of thinking that fake news is about lying, but fake, new, fake news is really not about lying because they all know that they're lying. I mean, except the morons that think that there is a kind of a pizza joint in wherever that abducts, abducted by aliens and you know all that. I mean, you have to be a super kind of moron to believe in it, but most of them know that it's absolute fabulation. And yet self-denial here is exactly this sort of use of exteriorization of fact uh, in order to produce a kind of a false sense of subjectivity. And I think that's where the, the, the left is losing ground because it cannot compete on the on the magnitude of facticity, so to speak. But I think, okay. but I think I wanted to uh, relate to Adam's point even more, and I would say that a lot of the criticism against Deleuze were, in a sense, misdirected. The whole notion of aestheticizing politics, in my mind, is missing the point about what Deleuze is doing because Deleuze is not trying to ground the political within the realm of se the sensory. Rather, he's trying to demarcate the boundaries or the limits of the political within the senses. And in that sense, unlike Virilio, he had, I think, correct intuitions. And that is, if you expand Deleuze and you are able to uh, include AI and uh, computational agents, you have to agree that beyond the machinic, there lies not just simply the metaphor of the body without organs, but there lies also the possibility of agencies without bodies, right? Without real imminent bodies. And I think that goes ba back to uh, Cambridge Analytica and different kind of, uh, you know, sort of hacking or or trolls that may be com completely computational, but they had more convincing currency 
than real kind of uh, pundits on television or in, in media. So in other words, this sort of what I would call computational acupuncture won the election for Trump. And not the human agents or the human agencies. And so maybe this is a bit off topic, but it's just making me think of it. So like, I guess we could say that part of the reason for this is, is capital in the sense that capital and the society of the spectacle has kind of is autonomizing itself to such a degree that it's trying to interiorize everything into it. And so perhaps that's kind of how this exteriorization happens is by mimicking all sorts of interiority and then becoming kind of self self independent. Does that resonate with, with what with what you're saying? Well, only to an extent because the limits of uh, the so-called the society of spectacles uh, conception is that it limits um, outcomes to conditions. In other words, the problem is that spectacle in itself is a decoy. I mean, if you look prescriptively at, at Debord kind of analysis, it's not it's not holding right now, because Trump can go on a tweet rampage or on a, on a clip on a kind of a, a quick television clip and say something and then completely contradict himself five minutes later, and it still will hold the same way in a pre-spectacular sense. The reason for that is that the conditions themselves are not made transparent or visible. And I think that's where I find situationism phenomenologically at odds with politics, at least, is that you have to assume both that the analysis is predicated on absolute conditions of visibility and yet their deficiency in the sense that they are always disposed to spectac spectacularization. Whereas the real thing is not a conspiracy theory, but is reflecting on the actual conditions of communication. And the actual conditions of communication are basically based on facticity in a metaphysical display sense and not on facts. So, uh, I mean, look, for example, in the last few days at the derailment from an as an aesthetic object I'm talking about. Look at the derailment of the North Korea-Trump uh, conversation, dialogue. It's absolutely spectacular, but it lacks the components that can be critiqued in the Deborian sense. Do you see my point? So in, in other words, Debord's uh, assumption is a little bit like taking the movie Matrix to be a kind of Baudrillardian prediction of like the age of AI and internet, which is not. There is no metonymic relation between reality and its abduction by the internet. The internet did not abduct reality in the matrix sense, sort of sense. Because the matrix, like uh, Debor, assumes a kind of conditions of visibility, uh, both as a causal conditions and as the effect. But obviously, they cannot be both. I, I think that's where the Deborian kind of analysis falls short for in my in my opinion is that it can either be understood as the effects or as the causal explanandum but not both at the same time adam could you repeat the last sentence uh, it was uh, bro broken the, the sound yes i mean uh, the, the the one on Debor. Yeah, so yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the point that I'm making is that you can either use the spectacle kind of explanation, explanatory kind of argument 
as the as the causal conditions or as the effect as the outcomes but not as both it's a little bit like basically media so-called philosophers that assume that the only thing that you need to uh, to do in order to explain either politics or science is to understand media better a kind of an all over even caricaturized take on McLuhan, so to speak. I think it's false because it can either co constitute the causal explanation or the byproduct of the causal conditions, but not both. I think, I think my larger point that I was trying to get at was more that the, just the autonomization that capital is, that the capital, I guess, is trying to decrease circulation time make it so, such that surplus value creation is happening sort of at, at every moment of our lives and is fundamentally built into the, the social fabric to always be creating surplus value. And this kind of involves like technical means which need to incorporate our subjectivities totally into these kinds of machines of, of surplus value creation. Again, I mean, uh, you can look at it from a Weberian point of view, and the, the answer would be yes. But then again, even in terms of what we understand as capital, uh, the difference between here a kind of a form of a constructivistic ideology of the marketplace, such as Marxism, as opposed to capitalism, is that capitalism is not really an ideology. Capitalism is a sort of a default mechanism of social exchange. And that's, that's exactly a kind of a false consciousness, even in the Hegelian sense, because the easiest thing to do for a Marxist is to critique capitalism as the wrong ideology. But that doesn't take us far. Because the problem with capitalism is that it's opportunistically anti-ideological. Uh, in, in that sense, I would argue that Husserl and Deleuze, and Husserl specifically identifies the misuses of the notion of ideology, that until the heydays of the 19th century were etymologically identical to the notion of metaphysics. So if you read like exchanges between Marx and his contemporaries or Boltzmann and his, his contemporaries, metaphysics and ideology is the same basically concept. And what is the, the concept of metaphysics or ideology? Is precisely the inability or the rigidification of the reflective act either in terms of the possible, the logic of the possible, or critiquing or doubting the conditions under which we get a production of, in, in the sense that you're implying, a capital. So I don't think that these are kind of universals in the strict sense. I think it's an interesting kind of aspect because one of the things about the kind of animosity between phenomenology and and Marxism as developed later, especially in the French version of Merleau-Ponty, you know, debate with South and so on and forth, is the misidentification of universal conditions for Marxism as opposed to concretizations such as the Soviet Union. Uh, with respect to to Marxism, and you know, for for a, a kind of a, for a Sartrean point of view, uh, it was a it was a plausible sacrifice to absorb, not for Meloponti. For Meloponti, it was an anomaly to the very thinking of Marxism. And I think that 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 is a, a kind of a, a debate over the phenomenology of capital that is in itself unresolved even today.
Another another point about spectacle and in relation to Patrick's uh, uh, comment or request to repeat the last thing is that if I go back to Mo's point about about the notion of the uh, fake news, fake news is not simply a speech act in the Austrian sort of sense. It does. It's not constituted simply by me getting on camera, on media, and basically giving you a completely false fa fact about something. That's not fake news. Fake news is precisely the reliance and the manipulation of interobjectivities in producing conditions that even fallacies cannot be refuted. let alone despectacularized. So in other words, even if you give the most succinct analysis of the spectacle, the spectacle is already unfolded. It cannot be reversed and into its shell. It already affected the world in, in the delusion sense of potential kind of vectors, of actual forces. In the, if you want, in the Nietzschean sense, not just the Lusian strictly, but in the Nietzschean, the Lusian axis of force, of a force, right? So uh, I think that's that's the damaging aspect of uh, fake news that it's that we're busy ourselves analyzing fake news in relation to either a sort of a speech act or discrepancy with facticity, but we're in fact. It's enabling conditions of interobjectivity that already have alienated themselves from what Adam was implying in terms of layers or degrees of subjectivity, as in the capital. If I understand what you're saying about capital, that's how I look at it, that a capital still has a resonance within the subjective kind of nesting of the social. Who do you work for? Who pay you? And so on and forth. Who do you take your loans from? You know, stuff like that. Where the total conditions of alienation promotes a kind of a new, a new ontological uh, order under which facticity itself is removed from factual positation. In other words, no matter how scientific we can go and bring the most effective scientific explanations, facticity has already removed itself into a kind of a surrogate reality that is based on conduits that are not necessarily posited from a worldview itself that is again and again challenged against the fabric, what Weinberger calls in a scientific sense, the fabric of the real or the fabric of reality. So, you know, in a, in a Husserlian sense, the modern vulgar scientific worldview is actually extremely hostile to science. And that's what we're seeing now as a way of, uh, of an exemplification. Uh, Adam, not to, not to, I, I hope we're not like derailing the class by, by holding on to this like three person discussion here. So at any moment, if you want to like go on with the lecture, you're welcome yeah. to continue on. But I just wanted to, to like, because like, you know what I mean? As someone who spent like some time with, with, with situationists and Debord, uh, like famous, like, essays and terminology. Mm -hmm. Just two quick comments and, and we can just like, you don't need to comment on it. In my yeah. opinion, like not only Debord was providing a kind of incomplete media theory or media philosophy, and I don't want to call it false or bad because there was some value in it and he was proposing things that were like at least, at least useful for a moment, but that, but that it, it really like, I mean, if you compare it to like, say, Heidegger's Age of the World picture, mm -hmm. or Benjamin's, uh, Benjamin's famous essay, 
the work of art, it really had not much to add to what was already said from the left and the right about these conditions back before the World War II. Because yeah. both Benjamin and Heidegger wrote those two essays that are like very opposed to each other, were at the same time very close to each other, pre-World War II, pre-television. And, and he really failed to understand, as you, as you mentioned, the cybernetic logic that was like underneath the decoy of, of spectacle. Like, like he basically, he should have read some, some cybernetic theory before writing his famous essay. But unfortunately yeah. he didn't, right? So, so he ended up like reinventing the wheel that was already put in motion by, 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 by these two giants of the, of the early 20th century from the right and the left. So that's that's all. Just I just wanted to add, and I I don't think like if you if you don't feel like commenting on it, it's perfectly fine. I just thought of like in conversation. Yeah, no, the, the only comment that I would add before moving to review uh, the remaining in the remaining twenty minutes before I take questions, a couple of things in relation to Dufres phenomenology of uh, traditional phenomenology of aesthetics, and I wanted to critique it. Um, using again Husserl and the foil of like uh, Deleuze. But I would add to it that I would, uh, I would argue that in as much uh, Jacques Rancière uh, Mo, uh, kind of contributes to the same delirium of, of, the, of the obsessing over the image. And um, this sort of overinvestment with the image is precisely a kind of a, a fundamental lack of the conditions under which both, as you mentioned, uh, Benjaminians uh, mass produced kind of conditions of the image, or even the Heideggerian kind of uh, techne an analysis of the image as a sort of as a, both a moment of a, a concealment and unconcealment is falls short. And uh, and I, I totally agree with it. I, I think that um, what, what we are in need for is not in repudiating conditions that are ontological, but really expanding the fabric of the ontos so that it can encompass novel conditions that emerged in the past like 80 years at least. And it, at uh, at at a kind of finer scale, I would say in the last like 35 years since the advance of uh, computational machines and the internet. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to go fairly systematically now uh, into some of the readings. And I've uh, mentioned like uh, Husserl's uh, critique of in, in his critique of crisis and the European, what he calls the European existence. And before I go to uh, Dufresne, uh, Michael Dufresne's uh, notion of pure aesthetics, I, uh, I wanted to, um, to basically reiterate that uh, Husserl's point about European sciences should not be understood territorially in the same sense that we talk about uh, about post-colonial theory for example uh, the european is a sort of a phantasm in fact one of the arguments that are often missed in husserl uh, is the fact that europe is a sort of a phantasm or a ghost or a kind of a chimera that rises from the very need to define origin and uh, from a kind of a mediterranean point of view the origin of europe as in the joycean sense is the mediterranean sea it's not the land there is a kind of a an ongoing if you want circulation or migratory pattern from africa to the middle east and asia to Asia Minor, to Europe, to the west of Europe, Gibraltar, and so on, that creates a kind of a circulatory system that is primarily defined by the sea and not by the territory. 
And the reason that I'm kind of emphasizing that in the notion of crisis, because the crisis is envisaged first and foremost as a stagnation of movement. Because the thought in itself, in the Blanchonian sense, always comes from the outside, right? The thought has to arrive from the outside. In the phenomenological sense, the subject is subjectified through the object's imprint on the subject's own intentional stance. Without it, the subject is not aware of its own. For example, how do I know that I woke up from a dream? I find myself lying on a bed awake, right? Or I, I wake up into the bedness of my posture. So it is the imprint of the objective world that defines the first moment of awareness to a change in a, in a place and space. And that leads to a kind of a very fundamental aspect of the notion of the a priori and the posteriori that, I've, that are found within Kant. And that within the Kantian realm relegates two objections that are fundamentally different than in later philosophies or in earlier philosophies. The first is the moment of the a priori in Kant that has to do with the, for, the pure form of intuitions, which are still not if you want what Husserl would call fulfilled as objects of consciousness. And for Kant, that stood for what he called the nomenon or the thing in itself. Now, what is the thing in itself? The thing in itself is a reiteration by Kant of the objectivity of the world or of the, if you want, the objectivity of things in the world that have to be assumed epistemically in order to not arrive at the kind of a, the type of solipsism that not only explain the genesis of the a priori in intuitions, but it also loses sight of its ability to prove it. So that's the kind of the so-called topological loop, if you want, of Kant. That on the one hand, epistemologically speaking, the a priori is grounded in subjectivity. And subjectivity here means the schematization of space-time intuitions. We can't understand numbers unless we rely on analyticity. We can't have anything more deductively reasoned than mathematics. At the same time, for Kant, the foundations of mathematics is actually the, the structure of the space-time intuitions. And yet, in order not to fall into this sort of gravitational hole, that subjectivity will be the ultimate stratum of analyticity. Kant assumes the boundary conditions that he calls the noumena or the things in themselves. But what is important to recognize is that the things in themselves are not, in fact, transcendental objects. They're part of a transcendental plane, but not objecthood. In other words, the thing in itself, if I lift again my cup and I take a sip from it and I assume that you assume that there is a real cup and a real liquid and so on and forth, the thing in itselfness of that act or event is transcendent of any perception per se. In other words, for Kant, the nomenon or the thing in itself is not really a thing. 
I would call it like an epistemological preposition or what Wittgenstein would call a kind of a stratum of certainty that for Husserl allows doubting. In other words, for both Husserl and, and later Wittgenstein, doubting is possible only because we have a layer of evidence, of certainty. There is a pre-givenness that enables doubting to occur. By the way, also politically, in any political uh, or economic, apropos capital, Adam, in any kind of uh, discourse on capital, you have to assume the pre-givenness of what capital figures into. Otherwise, there is no middle ground onto which you can doubt or question the notion of capital. It becomes utterly opaque or transparent, but evading discursive critique. So in that sense, the thing in itself is not really a thing. It's an after, it is a nautic after image. It's a project, it's a projectile of thought or metacognitive moment that allows itself to recognize the objectivity of things in the world. Now, things into themselves in the Husserlian sense is something quite different. So the first moment of a priori and analyticity is transformed by Husserl into actually a moment of intentional constitution. So intentional is no longer in the Brentanian sense, a psychological content or a fixed schemata, you know, because the Brentanian internal or innate objects were like extremely influence, influential on Gestalt psychology and so on and forth. And it's basically purporting this notion that in order to see square uh, figure, you have to have an innate squareness in your mind so to speak, so that you have a gestalt of a square as a cognitive schemata or scheme. Husserl went against it, against this grain of Brentanian psychologism or scientificism in terms of the objectivity of perceptions. And he relates to it through a process of what he calls inexhaustible retentions of profiles. So he takes a human position and inverts the human purpose of perception outwardly towards intention. How so? How do I know that I'm looking at a screen and not at a real encounter? Through a process of inexhaustible or numerous retentions of vistas, of angles, of perceptions. And the more I accumulate, these sort of perceptual vantage points, the more I'm able to sediment an object that is correlative to my act. So that my act of perception is substantiated precisely by the sedimented or accumulative objectivity of my own perceptions as projections. So if you want, you can always rely on a paradoxical object or manifold in the mathematical sense. Something that looks like a, a circle, but if you move around it, it's actually a square. Uh, Marcus Reitz, the Swiss artist that does all, do you know Marcus Reitz? Um, maybe I should show you a picture of, of his or a video. Adam, are you aware of how to use the screen share and all that? Because it's very easy to yeah. share something. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm just uh, Googling uh, the... 
Yeah, I'm aware to use the kind of the arrow sign. Absolutely. It will just take me a second because I wanted to share a video with you. Of, of right. Uh, Okay. Uh, where do I find the uh, Mo? Where do I find the the arrow? Uh, if you move your mouse on the screen, you see the arrow for screen share. Yeah. Yes. Wow. I got like uh, feedback. Yes, because you're sharing the same screen that has the hangout. You have to switch the screen to the screen you want to share rather than the, the screen that, because it's in a tab, I guess, right? It cannot be a tab. Okay. Have to remove the tab and then and then select that screen. Okay. But it's a lovely visual effect. They're all in yeah. there. It is. Okay. Let me uh, let me uh, do that. Close this one. I'm closing it, right? Yeah. It, it actually started showing, but then you closed it because you did the right thing for a, sec a second ago. Okay. So should I show it on like Firefox? No, no, you can show it on a separate window other than other than a tab of this one that's running the Hangout. I see. There we go. Except this one is your PDF. Yeah, I know. I'm going to uh, open a new one. No problem. How's that? Perfect. Oh, it, it does it again. It does it again. I have no idea what's happening on your end, but but if you if you share the link here, maybe maybe I can show it on my screen. Okay, I will do that. If you share the link of the video on the sidebar. Okay. Yeah, let me get out of uh, this. Uh, in the chat. Yes, sir. I'm still in the nested feedback, so. How do I extricate myself from this? You can uh, you can stop the screen share and then it'll go away and goes back to you and send me the link and I'll and I'll share and I'll and I'll show it to everyone. Okay. Yeah. And now I'm going to start like just share, share, like a, paste the link into the chat which is the icon above the green arrow yeah but what is oh uh, yeah, yeah 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 the link must be in your there we go just email me that yes Yeah. So basically, we're looking at uh, Marcus Wright's uh, work, and it's a sculpture. Can you hear me? Yes. And it's a sculpture installation. 
that really follows the same sort of uh, logic of perception that uh, that abides to the Husserlian kind of retentional perspectival sort of object. So in other words, do you see the face right now? Yes. Well, the face persists only for a moment from a certain angle. It has to go back now. Yes. But if you right. move... I'm gonna close the window. Yeah. Okay, but did you all follow the, uh, the link? Yes, I see the face. You did? No. The, the link is on the sidebar. Maybe later you can watch it. Basically, basically he's 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 like cutting the grass between these wooden poles. But then when the camera pulls back and you look at the whole picture, you see a you see that these pieces of wood form a face, and he's walking in between different different elements, different lines that constitute the face. Yeah, exactly. So basically the the kind of the, the sense of uh, retention, intentional retention or profiling that Husserl introduces involves a kind of a differential continuum of perception that is only decided ad hoc. It's never finitized. So in other words, any object that is identified as something is identified as something only in respect to its temporal continuum. It's possible that an additional profiling or profile of that object would radically shift the object into something else, as in the case of Marcus Reitz's sculpture that looks like a random minimalist sculpture installation. And yet, from a certain point, it looks like a face, right? So, in a sense, uh, against that, Dufresne's understanding, traditional understanding of uh, aesthetic objects, is uh, is based on a triadic division of either the objects, the, ob the aesthetic object in relation to its representation, to its truth and to its expression. Let me go one by one and explicate them. So the notion of uh, representation would be that the subject matter of representation of an aesthetic object, namely in our case, even of an artwork, is not necessarily relegated into the relation of the object, the artwork, in reference to reality, but to its own sense of what is referred to as the representational manifold. And examples that Dufay gives are like, for example, like WC the C. Do you know, do you all know WC the C, the La Mer? by WC. La Mer by WC, and I don't need to play it. Should I play it, Mo, or? If you feel it's necessary, send me the link and I'll pay, play it again, no problem. But I think maybe people are familiar with it, I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to play it as a background. Uh, no problem. As a background music, as I say, as I talk about it, because that's an example that Dufresne uses. And um, okay, so you should be hearing it every second. Can you hear it? Unfortunately, no. 
We can hear now. So, the free argument would be that the phenomenological grounding of Debussy Lamel doesn't really hold a representational sense of the ocean itself or the sea itself. In other words, it's not really a kind of a mimetic paradigm that the aesthetic object mimics the perceptual objects of that happen to be the, the sea, right? So what is mimicked there is actually the referent within the aesthetic object itself. That relates to what some interpreters of Husserl, especially of his logical investigations, identified in opposition to a more logical positivist or analytic understanding of the Fregian distinction between meaning as sense and reference, Zin and Bedeutung. Uh, insofar as Frege's sense of Zin and Bedeutung, sense and reference, is that any meaning stands for a representation of either sense or reference. The example would be that, uh, for example, that Frege uses, and it's used profusely in analytic philosophy is Venus, you know, the star, the planet Venus, that was construed by the Romans as two different stars, the evening star and the morning star and the evening star. So even though they shared different senses, because they both related or regarded them as two discrete planets or stars, they still referred in the referential mode to the same planet. And that's actually very important uh, in, in modern logic and uh, philosophy of language in understanding representation as delegated to either sense or reference. What Husserl does, he adds to it a nautic component so that the referential act or the reference becomes a referential act, the noemata. And uh, no, the, noe, the noesis or the kind of the, the mental content of that act is in fact related to the object itself. So you can argue that the first aspect of representation of aesthetic objects from a phenomenological perspective, as opposed to a strictly linguistic or logicist take on that, is that representing doesn't mean the same thing uh, for phenomenologists because it's not really representing either sense or reference detached from the object act of intention. Similarly, the loose take on representation, especially when we we'll kind of look into the logic of sensations vis-a-vis -vis Francis Bacon, is based on an extremely important distinction between the figural and the figurative. And for Deleuze, this distinction holds a sense that representing means invoking the present, literally to re-presence to allow the represence through the sign. And the sign can be perceptual sign or a linguistic sign as in the case, or a mnemonic sign as in the case of his analysis of Kafka or Proust, which in all cases, in both the case of uh, um, Francis Bacon or, or the case of uh, Proust, the representing is what accounts for a phenomenological constitution of representation. In a Bergsonian sense, it's very similar. And actually Deleuze takes it from Bergson. Bergson's understanding of representation is a little bit similar to a Borgesian, Jorge Luis Borges, kind of understanding of the nesting 
of a memory within a memory. A kind of a representing of the factum each time on a different level, on a different kind of degree. In terms of uh, the second aspect of a phenomenological constitution of aesthetic objects, I mentioned a representation and I also should mention the notion of um, expression or expressivity. The notion of expression of aesthetic object is not to be confused with what we call expressionism or expressivity. And in fact, that same understanding is shared again by Deleuze and is sort of what he calls Spinoza or expressionism in philosophy or what he calls expressionistic philosophy. In other words, that somehow through predication, there is a disposition of either a motive or experiential content onto an object. A close analysis of that would actually assume a different relation between the object and the aesthetic object. The object meaning the mediation as opposed to the object, aesthetic object as a sensory manifold. They're not the same thing. An analysis of Francis Bacon's paintings shows that precisely because the mediation such as the ring, the vectors, the divisions, the splash, the body without organs, so to speak, or the inviscerated body, the animality, all these are not expressivity itself, but forms of mediations. The mediation is important for Deleuze precisely because they form the middle a kind of in-betweenness that puts uh, I think you got muted somehow it says JH muted Adam Berg. Are, can you hear me now? Yes, it got fixed. Uh, okay. Now I can hear you, yeah. So, uh, so the, the, the second thing that Husserl, uh, Husserl's phenomenology kind of entails in terms of, uh, of uh, Dufresne's analysis is the notion of veracity. What is true in an aesthetic object? Uh, well, what is true, and he, he does that through Merleau-Ponty and through uh, Sartre, but I'm going to talk first about Merleau-Ponty and uh, in reference to uh, Cezanne's doubt, and then in relation to Sartre and the notion of illusion. So the truth in the aesthetic, of the aesthetic manifold, such as a, an artwork, is the inevitability of its perception. First and foremost, we experienced a sensory object the reality, what Saud would call and, and, and Merleau-Ponty would call the facticity of the sensory object cannot be shaken. Not even by a sort of surrealism or optical art. There is a fundamental constitution of the artwork, first of all, as a sensory conditions that configure a particular experience. That in itself is not the truth 
in the painting, if to use the kind of uh, the Ridian uh, take on on the boundaries of of uh, of perception. But for Merleau-Ponty, they constitute what Husserl calls the pre-phenomenal conditions. How so? If you look at uh, a painting by Cezanne, and typically it would be the apples or the mountains of, uh, or the mountain Mont Saint-Victoire of uh, like Provence, Aix-en-Provence, what we are actually witnessing in the Pontian and Merleau-Ponty sense is doubt itself as a stratum of veracity. What is the doubt in Cezanne? Is an epochal sense, an epochy sense, a doubting method sense of painting, that painting doubts its own construction. In other words, what we're gaining from looking at a Cezanne painting is not marveling at the mimicry of nature. Rather, what we're gain, gaining are the perceptual coordinates onto which we can transpose ourselves as if we are Cezanne right now, sitting in front of the landscape or the still life of apples, with its inexhaustible profile retentions, inexhaustible perceptual and incomplete perceptual continuum. And precisely that puts in doubt the possibility of succeeding and completing the rendition of the picture. So similar to Agnes Martin, or to Fluxus artworks, if you want. Cezanne doubts marks a kind of a veracity that is grounded in the imminence of perception itself. So in that sense, Merleau-Ponty goes beyond the Husserlian notion of the image, which I should say a few words later in a few minutes. And he stratifies this moment of doubt not only as a within the realm of pure reflection or hyper reflexivity or hyper reflection, what he calls a kind of a metacognitive aspect of reflection, but he looks at the doubt as a physical perceptual phenomenal conditions which are provided by aesthetic manifolds such as artworks that follow the same path of phenomenological reflection. So I would again stress and say that what is unique about Merleau-Ponty's notion of veracity of aesthetic objects is the fact that unlike Husserl and unlike Deleuze, it proposes a form of a sensory doubt, not part of the realm of illusions, but as part and parcel of the reiteration of perception itself. In that sense, Merleau-Ponty is absolutely unparalleled by any other kind of philosopher in relation to to art and specifically visual art. Um, I said that I will say another thing about, Merlo about Husserl and especially Husserl's posthumous published writings on photography in relation to fantasy and image in con image consciousness that coincides with neurophenomenology, such as Varela, Petito, Petit, and others, in the sense that they have to impress on us
an understanding of what Husserl would regard as the congruence between the real appleness and the sensorial counter counterpart of appleness. So just so that we understand what Husserl has in mind, the real response, sensory response, notic sensory response to say the appearance of an apple in neurophenomenological terms is identical to the fantasy of an apple. So that the difference between appleness as sensed from a direct perception and appleness as envisioned through an illusion of appleness is indistinguishable. That leads Husserl to a kind of a, almost to some extent prophetic in neurological sciences understanding. And apropos, someone mentioned Buddhism, so it would equally apply to Varela's fascination with Buddhism. And that is that we cannot metricize or temporarily measure the naughty constitution of perception because it happens in a non-temporal interval. And experiments like that are being conducted today to our amazement, and we see that perception happens faster than the nautic recognition or identification of something as such. And the question is why? Why are perceptually we're capable of experiencing aesthetic manifolds in this hyper accelerated fashion, even without thinking about augmented perception, and yet in their explication as nautic manifolds, we always fall short in finding a grounding that is sufficient. And I think that for Husserl, that became a problem to the very end. The relation between genetic and static phenomenology or phenomenological constitutions. Static constitution meaning how we perceive something as such and genetic, what are the conditions underlining our perceptions of something as such? That includes historicity and the pre-given, plane of the pre or horizon of the pre-given. So this is uh, this is what I wanted to review. I didn't do a review of Zahavi uh, notion of phenomenology, but I, I it would be suffice to say that I'm going to look at phenomenology and Deleuze in a freestyle. I'm not going to follow a kind of a historical or historicist take on either, because I think a prescriptive kind of use of either Deleuze or other phenomenologists uh, other than Husserl would be counterproductive, especially because I want to engage with interobjectivity and with aspects of the transcendental in relation to, uh, to aesthetic objects. So what I suggest that we do now is decide on next week, uh, how many are still with me? Patrick and Adam? We're all, we're all here. I think everybody else is there too. I think, I think Jay left and, and left us a big note on the side okay. about having to leave and some notes if you want to like Read that and okay. Well, and William's here too, and so is Laura. Maybe, well, maybe you know, we have about fifteen minutes left. I think maybe, maybe, maybe at this point, in addition to telling us which readings you'd like us to read, maybe yes. also, maybe also talk about if you have any uh, expectation in terms of assignments, in terms of writing assignments, because it's good if 
those who would like to um, benefit from your comments on the writing can 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 think yeah. about what kind of assignments you you would like to see. Yeah, that would be great. But also, if we can get some comments, besides, because you know what I mean. I spoke a lot, and and Adam also spoke some. But maybe Laura and William and Tegan, if they want to like join in and ask a question or something, there's there's about 15, 20 minutes time left. Yeah, that would be great. But yeah, but anyways, it would be great if you can tell us what to read for next week while okay. people are formulating questions or people are possibly formulating questions. Okay, so next week, uh, next week we should read uh, basically the introduction by uh, Deleuze and Guattari from Thousand Plateaus on the Reason. That's one reading. And uh, the other thing is would read like Intersubjectivity by Alexander Schnell, Intersubjectivity in Husserl's work. And uh, the last component of the reading is like from um, Intersubjectivity from Husserl, but it can be, apropos what you mentioned, it can be also Mo from Schutz. And I can try and look for a PDF from Schutz, Intersubjectivity and Multiple Realities. I have, I, have the, I have the phenomenology of the social world as a PDF, and I'm going to add it to the classroom. And well, I that, think I can well, mark the pages that I think where he explained his sort of like social intersubjectivity. Yeah. And, you know, I really, I really like to bring him up because he provides a frame that can be utilized to understand politics because he's talking about the social world. Yeah, and another philosopher that I would like to introduce later in terms of the political, especially in, to what I call the interior objectivity of personhood is Max Scheller. Max Scheller is really important. And uh, I think he, he kind of offers a, a par pragmatistic or non-analytic reductive understanding of persons. And what are political persons? So I think that would be totally complementary to Schutz. That's that's great. So uh, what I would suggest is that one of you or two of you choose to do one of the readings, present it in class for 20 minutes, then one other student uh, or participant will do a critique of, will take a time to critique the presentation, and then I'll kind of relate the perspectives. It, it, it would be great if, if those two people like identify who they like to be, so we don't have to like uh, spend time on that next yeah. week. And you can, I, I'm totally open to engaging and adjusting my, uh, my curricular plan to your interest. So even if you have like a, and that also relates to the writing or uh, art object or whatever you want to talk, to talk about in a paper or, or a presentation. So for me, if you want to write a paper, that's great. I would uh, highly recommend that you use at least two from the main readings and uh, con contrast and compare them uh, in relation to an art object or an event. It can be political as, in as much. And, um, or you can uh, do a presentation. That that also constitutes like a work for in my in my uh, take, you know. So, so who would who would like to who would like to uh, volunteer for next week with with uh, with the writing that Adam proposed? Uh, even if one person wants to do it, I think it will be fine, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be two people because it's maybe hard to organize over different time zones. I know Laura Laura's in Europe, normally in either Brussels or Antwerp. I forgot. And uh, Adam's in New York, and I'm, I have no idea where William is. And I know Tegan's also in US, but somewhere in the middle. So William's yeah. in California. Yeah, the time zones are very, very, very like diverse. So Laura, would you would you take on to 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 do the reading, to do a pre twenty minute presentation on the reading, because then I can take on to uh, to respond to you. Um, sure, I can try to do that. That would be lovely. 
which one would you like? There are three, basically three readings. Uh, the intro reason by Deleuze uh, and Guattari, the, the Schnell uh, on intersubjectivity in Husserl, or the shoots that um, Mo is going to upload. Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, Laura, how about I contact you and send you the shoots one because it's it's very like uh, concrete and it's very like it's not a hard read. But it's very like profound at the same time, and okay. Because I'm I, I, I've read it several times for a couple of couple of writing projects and and stuff. I'm kind of familiar with it, and I can I can we can work on it together. And okay, now I will cool. I will respond to you in class next week. Okay, sounds good. Now, if somebody else pick up uh pick up to okay, Tegan, why don't you actually present on Rhizome? That would be great. Read and present on it. And then we'll get Adam, who said he's familiar with Deleuze, to respond to you. Is that okay, Tegan? So rather than you responding, you actually will read and do a presentation on Rhizome. Can you do it? Tegan said. Are you yes. saying I will respond? Is that what you meant, or? No, I'm saying like Tegan. Tegan can do the presentation, and maybe you can respond to Tegan. I would respond. Yes, Tegan. Can you okay. confirm? Okay, yeah, he can do it. Okay, so so Tegan will present and Adam will respond to Tegan and then Laura will present on shoot and I will respond to Laura. I think that would be good in, in addition to whatever whatever Professor Berg wants to wants to bring up. Yeah, I think what I will do, I will do like a, a, a kind of a, an overture on Schnell's take on Husserl intersubjectivity and its relation to the life world uh, in, in response to Deleuze, just as a kind of a presetting of the, of the stage. Lovely. I would also appreciate if you have, from those of you who did not speak, if you have any comments or questions so that I can address it in the time remaining. Yes, there's about, uh, we have 10, 15 minutes left. Laura, William, Tegan, if you want to like, if you have a question, please like turn your mic on and, and, and engage. I don't, I don't really have any questions at the moment. It's like close to midnight here. So I've been yes. kind of not, not, I've been like putzing around my house a little bit at the same time. Um, but I guess, yeah, there's just like certain of the links that are being drawn. I guess I'm just waiting to see in the later readings, like how those things um be, be, reveal themselves so i guess i'm just looking forward to seeing some of the things we've talked about like also being demonstrated in the future texts just just yeah. quickly just quickly in response to laura i just wanted to say i love how right in the beginning for adam pop culture and politics and music and contemporary art were like mentioned in the same sentence and how <laughs> aesthetic applies to all i think that says a lot about his approach yeah, um, absolutely. it just makes me makes me so happy. That's great. I mean, I definitely don't prescribe to the kind of uh, stereotypical Kantian notion of aesthetic, uh, radical aesthetics, and aesthetic objects. I would I would challenge it, and uh, throughout, and we'll use like examples uh, throughout. And another thing that uh, Tijin has uh, Tijin has asked. In relation to the ontology, uh, he asked me about like what what do I mean by or can I expound on relation to the new ontology? So I would say that the conditions of uh, philosophy are not simply the conditions between a foreground and a background, but they're also the conditions of the middle ground. And what um, uh, we get with uh, Descartes in relation to the cogito, and even in relation to Husserl's transcendental cogito, the cogitatem or cogitatem, the kind of the thoughts are kind of disembodied. In the less we get like organs without body or body without organs. But I think that what the new ontology is suggesting is a non corporeal relation between agencies that occupy the middle ground. 
So that's what I take from the lose. The most important thing about the lose is actually the in-betweenness uh, of the agencies. So that's the kind of the type of the new ontology that Husserl and Descartes and even Kant are not calibrating into the into the ontos on what what is out there, so to speak, in the world. So what is out there in the world in a novel sense is that the middle ground seems to occupy a much more important ontological status than the foreground and the background. Does that make sense, Tejin? Actually, I think the question was by William. Oh, by William. So yes, because they're both using green color, and I, 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 I mixed them up too. So, so. Okay. So I mean, basically, the the kind of the new ontology would be a, a kind of a, an assertion that the traditional philosophical discourse did not consider the middle ground, the cogitatum, as critical to understand to an, analyzing philosophical questions. And I think right now, partially because of technology, AI, and different kind of agencies that are non-human, uh, the, the middle ground, the mediation, is, is becoming more robust, uh, ontologically speaking. So uh, you asked me, yes, but, like, let me see. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing a response from William, I think. I think he's, he, he wrote more on the sidebar. sidebar. I can yeah. read it if you want. I would love to hear a bit more about the ontological, about the new ontological order that you were talking about earlier, and a bit loud in my home. It's a bit loud in my home, but it seems almost as if the in-betweenness of the new agencies insofar as they're machinic, and increasingly automated, removed human subjects from certain decision-making decision uh, processes? Well, the answer is a kind of a yes and no, because uh, they're not, the agencies that we're talking about are not necessarily machinic. They're like uh, interpolations, if you want, of uh, systems into how subjects are mediating themselves such as in social media, for example. So I, I think that the notion of the machine and the, the machine and the humanoid is a little bit obsolete in that sense. Uh, we, we get like, uh, I can think of other kind of uh, philosophers who already posited the notion of like a kind of hybrid machine humanoid but without getting into the cyberpunkish notion of like cyborgs and you know and and androids i would say that the i would say that the machinic becomes like a local case within the notion of expanding sy system and networks and agencies so it's not just the machine is a localized body. Remember that Deleuze still feeds on this sort of post-Dadaist notion that the machine is either cinematic or a collage or a form of a collage, like the you know like Max Ernst or Picabia's kind of collages, right? Of or even Marcel Duchamp, right? There is a sense an urgency that. Uh, you know, in Duchamp, especially in Picabia, is that sexuality is machinic, like the tango dance, right? Like the futurists. But um, in fact, I think that the machine, the desiring machine opposition to the vitalistic body is rendered totally uh, obsolete when we think about systems now. So there is no, no need to hold the kind of the duality between machine body. So th that's the no. I mean, the, the in-betweenness is not an in-betweenness in the Deleuzian prescriptive sense of the relation between um, ruptures or chiasms in the life world or in between bodies or between machines, but it's actually the middle ground becoming much more ontologically opaque than ever before.
So another way to look at it, and that will come out and play a, a bigger role when I will talk about temporality and temporal constitution and objective temporalities and interobjective temporalities, is that uh, the notion of, uh, you know, like a historical experiencing the ever presence reshuffling kind of the the archiving if you want of the present is becoming more and more pronounced you know when you look at culture i mean i i have a lot of interactions with younger artists and one of the paradoxes in in like neo conceptual kind of neo object art making often is that there is a there is a fundamental lack of interest in historical or traditional data and it's paradoxical because there is a lot of appropriation going on at the same time it's a culture of vj or dj in a sense of resampling so that alludes to the middle ground becoming dehistoricized because if we understand the background is the historical continuum or sedimentation of artworks and we understand we understand the foreground as the generative emerging forms then the middle ground is abducting it into a kind of a time zone that is fundamentally atemporal so this is really an important phenomenological aspect of looking at uh, art production today i think yeah so william i don't know if i'm making sense here So I guess we we'll actually have almost going over over time. If 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 Adam and others don't have any question, maybe we can stop the class and thank thank everyone and see you all next week. What do you what do you think, Adam? Adam, do you have any last comment or question? Okay, great. What about you, Professor Berg? I have to prefer to ask Professor Berg to not mix up the atoms. I mean, there's 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 like a real confusion here. So there's all it's just not to like refer to you as a professor. So um, yeah. So if if everybody's okay, maybe maybe we can we can uh, say goodbye and stop the broadcast. Is that cool? Yeah, that's absolutely fine by me. Yes, so see you next week. And let's not forget, uh, we'll send an email reminding people about what they're presenting and who's responding. And also, I will upload the, the, the book to the Google Classroom. OK. And Adam, just one last question. Laura asked for a full syllabus. Have you communicated the full syllabus back to Jason or to, or to Razvan or someone so we can add it to the classroom? Yeah, I have. But I'm going to, um, I'm going to cut and paste it later today. Okay, so um, if you, if the, only, can... the, only, the only thing I'm going to, um, let me see where did I put it. Uh, uh, the only thing that I don't have in the full syllabus is the weekly reading that are uh, designated only topically. But um, I just thought that the weekly readings will be better assigned week, week to week, not to overload. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, I had just asked that because like something resembling the syllabus was posted in the Facebook chat and it's like just impossible to read like a okay. uh, multi-paragraph. Uh, I'm going to yeah. upload it as an announcement to uh, the dash, the, the kind of the, uh, the, the course uh, blog, okay? Cool. Yes, thank you. It. Perfect. Uh, but I, just in case I already... Um, pasted it and send it in okay the cool yes and 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 i will also add uh, i mean me me or or patrick will post this to the to the to the to the to the class blog as well yeah that's okay good. so thank you so much and thanks everyone you want to okay, thank you bye you. Bye. bye bye